name is Rob Dow. I am the executive director here at GTI. GTI is a 501c3 think tank dedicated exclusively to Taiwan policy research. The mission is to enhance the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and Taiwan with the world by contributing to a more informed discussion about Taiwan and its people. In pursuit of that mission, we undertake several major programs. Uh, they include our biweekly global Taiwan brief, speaker and timely analysis, and informed opinions about policy development related to Taiwan. Public uh, seminars are uh, an annual symposium in the fall. Uh, podcasts, we have three podcasts now. Uh, they include our Taiwan Security Review, uh, GTI Insights, and Taiwan Salon, uh, as well as uh, scholarship and fellowship opportunities for uh, people who are interested to conduct field research in Taiwan. If you're not already subscribed to receive all our updates, you may do so by visiting our website at www.taiwan.org. Now, I'd be remiss if I began today's program also without thanking our co-founders, our board of directors, our advisors, uh, one of whom is also on stage with me right now, as well as in the audience. Um, and our supporters and staff who make all our programs possible. So let's begin today's program. Uh, I'm truly delighted uh, to be joined uh, today by uh, a good friend um, and a mentor in some ways, uh, Dr. Toshi Yoshihara. Uh, Toshi is a, a senior fellow uh, at the Center for Strategic and uh, Budgetary Assessments, as well as a member of our uh, advisory board here. Um, he has previously held the John A. Barron Chair of Asia Pacific Studies at the U.S. Naval War College. Um, among the many accolades, um, you know, and, um, and, and awards that he has, went, he, has, he has gained over the years, uh, I think, you know, Toshi actually has earned uh, the credit of being one of the most featured speakers <laughs> at GTI's events to include now being his second book talk. Uh, here at GTI, uh, the first of which uh, held several years ago uh, with his equally excellent um, book uh, about uh, the Red Star over the Pacific. Uh, and that was a, and that has actually won, the awarded him the, the Navy Materials Civilian Service Award uh, by, uh, uh, by the U.S. Uh, Navy, I believe. Um, so again, we are truly delighted to be able to have Toshi join us this afternoon uh, to talk to us about his uh, latest new uh, book, uh, Mar, excuse me, Mao's Army Goes to Sea, The Island Campaigns and the Founding of China's Navy. As you can see from all the, uh, the posted uh, flags that I have uh, marked in this book, uh, it is a page turner of a lot of new information uh, that, um, you know, that I was not aware about and what found it incredibly interesting. And hopefully we'll be able to get Toshi to tease out some of those uh, interesting findings, um, but, you know, really go uh, and purchase a copy of this book because there's a lot of details here that I know for a fact we will not be able to cover in the short time we have with him uh, just now in the hour that we do have. So, uh, Toshi, welcome back to GTI. Thank you. Good to be back. Great. So, as I like to start off with all our book talks, is give you an opportunity to just really talk about, you know, why you wrote this book about the founding of the PLD. Sure. Um, happy to talk about sort of the origin of the book. Um, first point I think worth, worth raising is, as we all know, the Chinese Navy, the Chinese Naval Modernization, have become a really important topic, uh, partly because uh, the Chinese Navy has become a, a global force. It is now an expeditionary force, uh, second only in capability to the U.S. Navy. This is something that we probably could not have said 10, 15 years ago. Um, the vast majority of the modern ships that we see in the Chinese Navy today did not exist 10 years ago. Uh, this is an extraordinary buildup. Uh, we know that uh, senior U.S. military leaders have likened uh, this to essentially the pre-World War II naval buildups that we've seen in the past. So we haven't seen this kind of a phenomenon, rapid buildup, since the Second World War. So, and that, of course, led to a significant shift in the regional balance of power, uh, and of course, uh, significant implications for uh, regional security and for uh, U.S. naval and military strategy at large. And so, the Chinese Navy has become an important component of China's defense strategy, its global strategy, 
Uh, and so we need to study the Chinese Navy in all its aspects. And I think that's really the starting point of the book, which is that we, because of this rapid growth, we tend to focus on the Chinese Navy in its present. Like we tend to want to gravitate towards uh, the shiny new toys that the Chinese Navy has been able to put to sea in recent years, while in some ways neglecting uh, its past. And so I wanted to make sure that we uh, have a better understanding of the Chinese Navy's past to offer this historical context that then um, allows us to trace these continuities that I think we're able to discern in either Chinese naval doctrine or in Chinese naval outlook. And so really, my view is that in order to understand the Chinese Navy today, we really do have to understand the Chinese Navy's past, in particular through this book, uh, the Chinese Navy's origin story, uh, if you will. The other reason that I looked at this particular period, the founding of the Chinese Navy uh, and its earliest offshore campaigns, uh, is that I personally didn't know much about this period. Um, and like many, I think, uh, Western analysts, uh, I assumed that it wasn't really that important uh, because, of course, the Chinese Navy was very weak, was relatively primitive during this time period. Uh, and so I assumed that it also wasn't probably that interesting. Um, and if you look at the Western literature, uh, the writings in the West tend to be very underdeveloped uh, on this period. Um, if you look at some of the great works on the Chinese Navy, they typically give a quick nod to the history and then they move right along. Um, and so uh, this period is basically, you know, as I described in the book, a blank canvas uh, that needs to be uh, filled. And uh, the studies that have looked at this period are now decades old. Some of the classics that, that, that we turn to are now decades old and relied on the kinds of information uh, that they offer a incomplete picture because they did not have access to the kinds of data, information, and open sources that we now today enjoy. Um, and what really struck me was, you know, as I was uh, reading more about this history, was I came across memoirs, firsthand accounts by um, folks who were on the ground operating uh, that provided really fascinating details, and that there was really very large quantities of these writings that were available, but importantly, largely untapped in the West, largely unexploited in the West. So I thought that it was a real opportunity to look at these unexamined sources to tell a more complete origin story. Um, and I realized that this project was feasible when I wrote an article back in 2016 for the Naval War College Review on the 1974 Paracel Sea Battle. Uh, that was the sea battle between the Chinese Navy South Vietnamese Navy that enabled the Chinese to seize the Paris Elders, which remains a flashpoint, a, a, a point of contention between uh, China and other rival countries in the region. And that, that process of doing the research made me realize that you can, in fact, construct a really interesting, detailed story based on these open sources. And so I applied my experience in looking at the 74 battle and applied it to this earlier period in 1949. And what I discovered there, too, was that uh, the tactics that the Chinese employed in the 1974 Paracel Sea Battle were, in many ways, replicas of what they did in 1949. There was, in fact, a, a, a significant amount of continuity in terms of the way the Chinese thought about operations and tactics. That reconfirmed to me, therefore, that, that the importance of looking at this past and to try to discern uh, continuities over past decades, but even till to today. Okay, great. That's great to understand. So let's dive right in then. I mean, I think for those uh, people who may not have the time to really more, uh, to, to read the entire book, which I certainly encourage you to do, I think was able to do so in, a, uh, in over a week, in just a weekend, uh, in reading it. Um, but uh, maybe a cliff note version of really what the, uh, the major themes and key findings are that you think you know, really needs to be uh, uh, understood uh, from uh, anyone who interested in, in picking up. Sure. So I think the, the key question that I try to answer uh, in this book is how did an agrarian-based, land-bound, revolutionary army go to sea? Uh, this, is, this was the key puzzle, and it's a remarkable story, right, because we're talking about the People's Liberation Army that have been fighting for decades in landlocked regions, have been either waging a 
guerrilla campaign against the nationalist and the Imperial Japanese Army, or were later in the Chinese Civil War, waging major conventional battles on land. How did this organization, basically a complete stranger to maritime affairs, adapt to this new environment? Um, and its transformation, at least the transformation of several of its units to go to sea, I think you know, represented a really interesting story that, that um, I could uh, that um, I could tell. Um, I recount uh, in many of these cases, many of the officers and troops uh, had never even seen the ocean. I mean, they heard about it in parables, right? in fairy tales, uh, but they've never actually seen the ocean. So how do you then uh, retrain these troops, retrain these officers to deal with an entirely new domain with an entirely new service? Uh, and I thought that this was a story worth telling because it is an interesting episode in naval history in general. But this story also took place at a critical time during the Chinese Civil War. So this was when the Chinese Civil War was just about to wrap up. Uh, the communists had defeated uh, the nationalists at some very decisive battles in northeastern and north China. The uh, Yaoshan campaign in Manchuria, uh, the Huaihai campaign in the North China Plains, Jing campaign, where uh, the communists were able to quote unquote uh, liberate, uh, peacefully liberate uh, Beijing. Uh, by that point in early 1949, uh, the vast majority of Chang's best forces were either wiped out or were captured. So we're looking at a situation where the nationalists were reeling from a series of defeats, falling back south of the Yangtze River. They were retreating to the coastal provinces. They were putting their forces on these offshore islands, and ultimately they were retreating to Taiwan. And so Mao Zedong's forces, as they were poised to cross the Yangtze River, which was basically the, the last maritime barrier that separated the communists from South China, had some key decisions to make. And one of the key decisions is, how do you deal with the next theater of operations that will be intensely maritime and nautical in nature? And it was at that moment in early 1949 that Mao Zedong decided that he needed to build an air force and he needed to build a navy. Uh, and that, again, he needed to reorganize his forces by creating a new service from scratch, essentially, uh, to deal with an entirely new domain. And this is, of course, an extraordinary challenge. Uh, and there were all sorts of institutional challenges that the uh, that the Mao's armies needed to uh, resolve in order to go go to sea. And so that 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 that's really kind of the backdrop of the story, and also the key question that I wanted to ask: or How does an army go to sea? Um, the book itself uh, is organized um, around um, institutions. So instead of looking at uh, this earlier period from 1949 to 1950, from a chronological perspective, I've organized key sections of the book around uh, key institutions. So the first half of the book, I looked at the institutional buildup of the Chinese Navy. I'll talk a little bit about that later in terms of uh, the kinds of personnel they needed, the kinds of hardware. The second half of the book looked at these campaigns. But again, instead of looking at them chronologically, I looked at them in terms of the major fighting organizations responsible for specific theaters of operations. So I looked at the third field army's um, operations in eastern coast of China, and I looked at the fourth field army responsible for the southern coast of China. And the reason uh, that I organized the study along institutional lines is my view that institutions matter. Because institutions are those organizations and bodies that sort of pass on uh, corporate memories of an institution. Uh, they possess unique personalities that they pass on down through the years. Uh, they possess essentially the institutional DNA, right, that, that, that they pass on, and that those traits can be discerned to this day. So my view is that if we better understand the institutional origins right, of the Chinese Navy, that might help us better assess the Chinese Navy today um, in terms of its institutional personality. And, I, and my hunch was that for any organization, whether it's in the private sector or the government sector, is that historical experiences, particularly sort of the moment of creation, if you will, has a huge impact on the way the institution looks at the world, uh, by the way it identifies what's important to it, and so forth. So by understanding the moment of creation for the Chinese Navy, 
we might get a sense of what the Chinese Navy prioritizes in terms of things, values, its attitudes about combat, uh, the kinds of leaders they want to promote, maybe even the kinds of war they would prefer to fight. And I would say that this institutional outlook is applicable to the U.S. military service, right? the U.S. Navy's moment of creation uh, coming out of the American Revolution probably still says a lot about how the U.S. Navy thinks about the world today. Well, it... Okay, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but if you would you have to want to make a point, final point? Well, uh, yeah. So um, I wanted to offer some findings. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so one of the key findings in looking at this uh, origin story, and there's two actually, uh, is the, the first is that it overturns a, a kind of a lingering conventional wisdom uh, about this period uh, in the West, uh, which is that the Chinese naval leadership of the 50s and 60s were chosen largely for their ideological that they were chosen for their loyalty to Mao and to the party. They were not chosen for their technical expertise. And that in part explained why this period seemed uninteresting to outside observers, right? Because who cares about ideologues, right? We're much more interested in people who have the, the technical knowledge and the know-how to build up these institutions. Uh, and in my reading of the Chinese writings, it turns out that this idea uh, that uh, more red than expert is the, is the kind of the bumper sticker is the phrase. Is that that's an oversimplification of the Chinese, lead, Chinese naval leadership of this time. That in fact, Chinese naval leaders were very aware of the need to acquire uh, the technical expertise as well as the software, the know how to build these institutions. They value, for example, the importance of professional military education as early as 1949. So, this idea that they neglected technical expertise. Um, and that they really focus on ideology is really either oversimplification or a misreading, I think, of the Chinese Navy's origins. Second conventional wisdom uh, that uh, I think was overturned in my reading of literature is this idea that the PLA basically Soviet automatons, that the Chinese military leadership basically unthinkingly borrowed from Soviet doctrine because that was their only source of knowledge, particularly on Naval affairs. And it turns out in reading the Chinese literature is that that's again an oversimplification. That the PLA, in fact, I found went to great lengths to try to instill their own fine traditions in their naval outlook. Uh, that they believed that they could make it a, a really powerful imprint on the, the Chinese Navy institution based on its own historical experiences, based on its combat experiences on land. And to the story of how they translated those experiences into the maritime domain was also a really important part um, of the story. I think ultimately the, the key finding in terms of the so what for uh, U.S. policymakers and U.S. strategists uh, is that uh, the PLA and the Chinese Navy in particular, um, they have a proud history. This is a history of a series of successes against uh, significant odds. Uh, and that they believe they have a good story to tell, a story that they tell themselves and then they tell to others, a story that they tell in order to enhance the organization's esprit de corps. And that if we neglect this history, right, if we if we pretend or if we act as if this history is not important, then I think we risk misdiagnosing uh, the PLA and the Chinese Navy in terms of its institutional health. Oh, yeah, and you're, you're absolutely right. There's so much in there packed about the institutions as well as the campaigns, and we'll get to those, you know, uh, later in our discussion. But let, let's talk a little bit about the people, because you also spent a good portion of the book in the beginning, especially describing some of the instrumental players in the founding of the uh, the Chinese Navy. So so talk to us a little bit about how uh, Zhang Aiping and, um, and, and, and Xiao uh, Jingguang. Yeah. Uh, who were they and, and why were they, you know, significant to the founding of the PLA and, and the purpose of your, of your book? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not a trained historian. And so this experience of writing this book was really interesting because it kind of stretched me uh, and it really took me out of my comfort zone. I think one of the things that I, I liked about the histories that I read is when the historian brings some of these personalities to life. So uh, I make a very amateurish attempt to bring some of these personalities to life because I think personalities and leaders matter. Uh, and so um, I'll talk about both uh, Zhang Aiping and Xiao uh, Jingguang as the sort of the key uh, leadership personalities uh, and, the, and the challenges that, uh, that, that uh, they confronted. So um, when I give a more um, 
straightforward book talk when I do a summary of the book. I typically start by asking the audience to sort of imagine, to ask the audience to uh, project themselves back to early 1949. So I'll do the same with you all. You all. So imagine uh, that you're a 30 uh, some year old rising uh, army officer of the People's Liberation Army in early 1949. I want you to imagine that in this particular case, uh, you were wounded in a previous combat experience. You've just returned to duty uh, and you're anxiously uh, waiting to pick up a new assignment to join your comrades to engage in what would be a critical campaign, which is the Cross River campaign. As I said, once you cross that river, you begin to fan out and you basically conquer the rest of South China. Now imagine that you're now entering into your boss's office, the theater commander, and you're eagerly awaiting this new assignment where you'll be commanding forces to conduct the Cross River campaign. And your boss basically brings a complete surprise on you. Uh, you've been asked to build a Navy. And of course you're shocked, right? But this is a totally unexpected assignment. And you protest, you say, you know, I don't have any background in naval affairs. Um, I barely have a middle school education. I, I know the Navy is a highly technical affair there's no way that I can I can do this. And the theater commander says, well, we didn't choose you necessarily for your technical expertise or your knowledge of naval affairs. We chose you for your managerial skills and your ability to manage personnel. Oh, and by the way, the big man, the big boss, uh, has already approved this assignment, meaning Mao Zedong, right? So <laughs> when your boss tells me that Mao Zedong has already picked you for the assignment, you're going to say yes, right? Um, so imagine that then you uh, reluctantly accept the assignment and you walk out of your boss's office. And as you're walking out of the office, you realize you have no headquarters, you have no staff, you have no money, you have no resources, you have no capabilities, um, and you're likely going to have to borrow um, from the existing field army that you're working for to make up the skeletal crew that's going to be the nucleus of this new Navy. That was essentially what happened to John Ivey, who became the commander of the East China Navy. Um, while, it is, while it was a regionally oriented Navy, the founding of the East China Navy is today considered to be the founding day of the National Navy, the People's Liberation Navy. Um, and so he was faced with this extraordinary task of having to build this new Navy essentially out of thin air. Um, and, you know, reading his accounts about his experiences, um, I felt for the guy, right? I mean, you can't but, but, but not feel some sympathy towards a person who's given his essentially an incredibly um, difficult task, um, made more urgent and made more impossible by the fact that his theater commander basically said, oh, yeah, and by the way, you're building this Navy so that we can conquer Taiwan. And we got to get this done by the end of the year. Imagine that, right? It's early 1949, and he's expected basically to put up this navy to conduct the sea crossing over you know, 100 nautical miles or whatever, take uh, a major island feature. So you can imagine both the urgency and the pressure that was placed on him to build up this, this navy. Uh, now, uh, Xiao Jingguang is the commander of the National Navy, the People's Liberation Army, and basically what they did was to use Zhang Haiping's experiences at the regional level as a laboratory to draw lessons for the larger national level buildup. Both of them uh, faced a, a very similar set of challenges, and I kind of broke it down into four areas. The first is human capital. I think they understood early on that you needed the software, you needed people with the technical expertise and knowledge to, to engage in this naval buildup. And they realized or that they had not, right? We're talking about revolutionary cadres who've been waging a guerrilla campaign or a conventional campaign on land for years. So they realized that one of the ways to make up for their lack of software was to actually borrow them. Borrow them from who? From the nationalists. And so they made a very deliberate effort to recruit uh, through various recruitment programs, enticements, and even amnesty programs to bring national, former nationalist flag officers uh, and sailors out in from the cold, to bring them in from the cold, uh, and then to incorporate them into the Navy building process. Uh, and so during this period, in particular in this period, there was a surprisingly large percentage of 
high level officers as well as sailors who were from the nationalist camp. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges there. The second challenge that they faced were capabilities. Um, during this time period, the nationalists had basically taken all their best ships to Taiwan. In the meantime, the nationalists used their air power to destroy whatever else that was left behind on the mainland. And so what the communists had left were basically a hodgepodge fleet of old ships from various countries. Their national origins varied from, you know, Italy, France, Britain, Germany, Japan, and, and the U.S. Um, and many of them were very aged from very different eras, going back to the Republican era, all the way back, in some cases, to the Qing dynasty. Uh, so this was an incredibly uh, decrepit uh, and diverse fleet. And you can imagine, thinking about this from a maintenance logistical perspective, what a nightmare it is to try to keep this fleet going. Um, the third is personnel, and it's related to the human capital question, is how do you integrate the former nationalists into the communist ranks, uh, in which the civil war is still being waged, right, being waged to the bitter end. You have communist cadre who, of course, are, are, are ideologically trained, know that the nationalists are, you know, have, you know, possess ideological contaminants. Right? They represent the bourgeoisie. Uh, they come from a very different social economic background. Um, and of course, many of them had blood on their hands. We're talking about integrating your arch nemesis, your adversary, into your ranks. So how do you do that, right? How do you manage uh, that integration process? So uh, things as uh, seemingly prosaic as uh, feeding the troops became a problem because many of the nationalist troops were uh, much more uh, accustomed to eating uh, uh, higher grain, higher quality grains. So white rice, so processed rice, uh, they did not want to eat millet. They did not want to eat unprocessed grains. Uh, and so how do you do this? How do you feed the troops who are working alongside each other, yet you're deliberately treating them unequally? Right? How do you convince the communist cadre that this is the way to go? Even though the communist cadre were trained to know that they were fighting for a new China and with this, this inequality should not take place. So this is a real personnel management issue for both uh, John and Xiao Jingguo. And then the last thing is the learning piece of it. How and where do you learn from? So as a document, I think both leaders understood that you don't just borrow unthinkingly from the Soviets, that you have to borrow selectively the things that are relevant to China's local circumstances, uh, that you can borrow selectively from the former nationalists mm -hmm. to let the national, the former nationalist flag officers to, uh, to offer their second opinion about what strategies and doctrines to adopt. And then most importantly, I think the most important part of the learning process is how do you translate the PLA's own fine traditions into the maritime domain? So what we saw in this instance was not this very simplistic picture of unthinking learning from the Soviets, but a very complex uh, process of hybrid learning where they're drawing from many sources of knowledge to inform their thinking about uh, maritime affairs. Now. Um, uh, Xiao Jingwang, as the commander of the Chinese Navy, uh, hosted a really important meeting that I document in the book in August of 1950, which was essentially uh, the long-term planning for the Chinese Navy. And what we find, even as early as 1950, was a clear recognition that China needed to match its uh, straightened resources uh, to a realistic set of goals and strategies. And so they developed what would essentially become uh, near-coast defense meaning the Navy would be designed to defend the mainland from uh, invasion from the sea. It would largely be subordinate to army operations to the extent that they would collaborate with the army to help that invasion, Western Imperial invasion in the United States or nationalist counter invasion from, from the sea. And that they had set very realistic goals in terms of the kinds of resources that they would need to build up this Navy. It was at this point that they decided that they needed to focus on coastal defensive forces, like fast attack craft, um, submarines, and shore-based aircraft. And that, that tripartite force structure was a, a, was a guiding force in terms of the Chinese Navy's modernization for decades. Uh, and what's interesting is, of course, we see still elements of that, the legacies of that to this very day. So I would say that both uh, Zhang Haiping and Xiao Jingwang were 
um, deeply influential in shaping the founding of the Dodgers. Yeah, and you cited some real interesting data and specific data points in there that I just found shocking in terms of just a percentage uh, of the of the of the of the rank of sailors that were actually nationalists. Exactly. So, um, so research there. Um, I think for those in the audience who may be, you know, just following us from the very beginning, you may be wondering why the, a, a book talk about the founding of the PLAN is relevant to the Global Taiwan Institute. Um, but it very much is so, and this is particularly, this is the portion of it that I think really is going to get, um, get into the weeds of this, because uh, a good portion of your book is actually focused on the campaigns, right? And, uh, and the series of campaigns that, you know, in fact, defines the borders uh, between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China today. And so um, can you kind of sort of walk us through some of these uh, definitive campaigns? Uh, in particular, I would like you to focus on the, the battles of uh, Jingmen and Kuomintol, uh, Dunfu. And then, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the, the other example, so the first two examples would be the, the successes of the nationalists in repelling the communists, and then China. Right, which is the opposite way in which the comments prevailed. <laughs> Why you know these are uh, important campaigns that you chose to focus on uh, in this uh, in this book? Yeah, uh -huh. so I think it's important to note again uh, that this book is in many ways it has Taiwan as the backdrop. Taiwan casts a long shadow over this entire book, right? Because the institution building of the navy was designed to build a force capable of crossing the seas to type to to seize Taiwan. That was the ultimate goal. Um, and then these offshore campaigns were also closely related to uh, the seizure of Taiwan because the, the, the communists had concluded that if you didn't see some of these key offshore territories, that China would be in no position to then follow on to attack Taiwan. Um, that was particularly the case of the, uh, it's actually the Xiamen Jingmen campaign. They, they came in, in a close succession. Um, so, and I realized too in, in, in reading the accounts is that you can't understand what happened in Jingmen without actually first studying what they did in Xiamen. So the communists had concluded that in order to have a, a significant platform from which to launch this cross strait invasion, they would first need to secure uh, Xiamen and Jingmen. And so they decided to engage in these um, offshore operations to take, first take Xiamen, and then to take uh, Jingmen. The Jingmen campaign was led by the Third Field Army. And the Third Field Army basically, if you read the accounts, did absolutely everything wrong. Like everything that you shouldn't do for a complex and devious operation. Every mistake that you could possibly could they committed. Um, and so let me just go through sort of the list of things that the Third Field Army uh, did that proved to be sort of disastrous. So first of all, um, the commanders uh, of the Third Field Army had basically bad intelligence partly driven by, I would say, hubris, overconfidence, uh, and uh, a, a sort of um, a failure to sort of reassess the circumstances, the rapidly changing circumstances on the battlefield. The bad intelligence led them to significantly underestimate the number of defenders that were on Jingmen leading up to the invasion. And again, reinforced by their overconfidence, their, their hubris, because of their previous successes. You might call this victory disease and the, the impact of victory disease on bad intelligence. The second was uh, bad command and control. Um, and for those of you who have had command and control forces, um, you know, it, it would become very clear to you why uh, the communists failed. So you had basically one core organization uh, oversee subordinate units from another core that had no interactions with whatsoever. Had, did, didn't know any of the subordinate commanders from units from the Southern Corps. And it was this one corps that was responsible for operating these, basically this mishmash of, of uh, units. Um, and so there was going to be naturally poor coordination, poor communications, and so forth. Um, the third, which is related to the earlier Shaman campaign, was that they succeeded in taking Shaman. But in the process of taking Shaman, they suffered significant shipping losses. And it's important to note that the shipping here is not, you know, amphibious assault ships. The shippings are basically junks. Oh, the vast majority of them unmotorized junks or fishing trawlers that they conscripted from the civilian sector. They basically conscripted boatmen. They either forced them 
into forced conscription. They bribed them, they paid them off, or they gave them some incentive to borrow basically their ships and the boatmen to carry their troops across. So uh, they succeeded in taking Shaman, but in the process, a lot of those ships were sunk. So now you can imagine when the communists turned to the boatmen again, and said, oh yeah, oh, by the way, you're doing Jingmen next. <laughs> so many of the boatmen, frightened and having seen the terror, the horror of these amphibious operations, fled the area. They took their boats and just ran away. Like, I'm doing this again, right? Uh, many of them either scuttled their boats, buried their boats, or just took their boats and went to other places. So the communists now had to go out of the area to recruit other boatmen from areas that didn't know anything about the water conditions surrounding Jinmen. And that was going to be uh, another sort of ingredient for uh, disaster. So, okay, lack of shipping. The lack of shipping led to a bad plan. So, because they didn't have enough shipping to bring everyone ashore that they thought was needed to bring everyone ashore, they decided to, to bring the first wave of troops across the Jinmen. Then, those boats would go back and bring the second wave over. So they were basically cutting a force that they thought would be the minimum necessary to invade the island in half, right? The assumption was that those boats would then would very rapidly go back to the mainland, pick up the troops and bring them ashore. Um, the other uh, issue was bad execution. Uh, the boats as they neared uh, Jingmen were swept around by the winds, by the currents. And so they were scattered across the beachheads and elsewhere. And so they were not concentrated, they were dispersed, and many of these units basically charged headlong into the island without waiting for uh, reinforcements. And then because strategies interactive, the nationalists had actually significantly reinforced the garrisons. In fact, they brought aircraft, ships, and importantly, Sherman tanks. And they would later be called uh, the Bears of Jingmen because uh, the nationalists used combined arms tactics to basically systematically wipe out the communists. Uh, it was essentially a bloodbath. But the worst of it was this issue of shipping. The, the, so the ships arrived, the boats arrived uh, at night, right, because they wanted to avoid a nationalist air power, which could only be used during the day. So they went over by night, they offloaded the troops, and then the tide receded. So all of the boats that had landed on June were trapped in these flat uh, mud flats. Uh, and then when day broke, the nationalists then used the air power, naval power, to systematically destroy literally every single one of those boats. And I document in the book how the second wave troops were supposed to get picked up later. They could physically see the boats turning into a fiery wreckage. They realized that not only could they not reinforce their comrades, but their comrades were trapped on the island. Uh, and with that uh, came essentially um, you might call a massacre. They were massacred. Over the course of about three days, uh, 9,000 troops were either killed, wounded, captured. Uh, division worth of troops were lost uh, over a course of three or four days. It was an absolute disaster, right? It was a catastrophe. Mao Zedong himself admitted that this was his worst defeat in the last 18 months of the Chinese Civil War. In fact, what was so important about the Jingmen campaign is that it stopped the PLA in its tracks. It now complicated a cross sea campaign was going to be. It awakened to the com it awakened the communists to the realities of the unforgiving realities of an amphibious campaign, and they had to go back to the drawing board and say, "We really need to get the shipping uh, uh, issue resolved. We need to have them motorized. We need to have ships of bigger tonnage. We need to have more troops. We just needed it to be much more serious about this enterprise." Um, and so I think it was very significant because, uh, of course. Jingmen remains in the hands of the Republic of China. It remains a constant reminder of the division between China and Taiwan. Um, it was the epicenter of two uh, uh, crises, the, the, uh, the 54 and 58 Taiwan Strait crises. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it became a strategically significant feature uh, as a result of this battlefield failure in October of 1949. So it's actually it had has a pretty significant strategic legacy that can be felt to, to this very day. Now, let me give you the, yeah. the, the flip side of the story, which is the success, which is the communist campaign against Hainan led by the Fourth Field Army. Fourth Field Army essentially uh, did everything right. They, they did not do any of the mistakes, they did not commit any of the mistakes that the 
So they had good intelligence. They did not underestimate the adversary. Uh, they engaged in intensive preparations and training for the Trotsky campaign. Uh, they uh, acquired adequate, more than adequate shipping. Uh, they mobilized the local societies on the peninsula where they were assembling the forces. They it basically engaged in people's war in a sense that local communities, local industries were mobilized to provide all of the necessary logistical support to uh, support the campaign. Uh, they also engaged in their version of anti-access area denial, A2AD. They began to deploy um, air defense units onto the peninsula in order to deny nationalists use of their air power around the areas where the forces were assembling. That allowed them to uh, assemble the forces and train without being harassed and molested by the nationalist defenders. But the, to me, I think one of the key factors that led to the success of Hainan was a local insurgent force that was operating on Hainan at the time, the Chongya Column. Uh, the Chongya Column had been operating as insurgents on Hainan really for decades. 15,000 strong, they operated from these safe havens or safe areas in this inaccessible interior of Hainan. They were well-resourced, supported by the local populations. The, the, the analogy, I guess, would be the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, right? Local insurgents knew the local terrain well, supported by the local population. So what the, what the communists tried to do was to tip the tactical balance of power on Hainan by conducting clandestine transits. They would smuggle PLA, advanced PLA troops uh, onto the island. And the way they did that was they sailed the, the boats further down the east and west coast of Hainan, away from the heavily defended, well-defended northern coast of Hainan, inserted the troops on the islands. These troops would then link up with the Chongya column units, and then they would bring them into those uh, safe havens. The plan was not only to tip the tactical balance of power on Hainan, but then when the, when the big invasion day came, those forces would come out and attack the nationalists from the rear and tie down the nationalists and thereby creating a more favorable condition for the full-on assault to take place against Hainan. And what happened was, of course, it was a significant uh, success. Uh, they were able to put ashore, I think, 45,000 troops. 25,000 troops in the first, and then 20,000 in the second wave. Um, it is considered to be one of the largest post-war amphibious operations. Um, so it's a pretty remarkable feat. Uh, again, a story that I only knew about tangentially, but as I read the details of, of how they executed that campaign, I became more and more impressed. Now, the strategic outcome of Hainan, of course, was huge for the communists, right? Because it deprived the nationalists um, a platform from which to launch a counter counter revolutionary attack against the mainland. Uh, it basically pushed all of the nationalists off a major feature. Hainan's about the size of Maryland, so it's a pretty big uh, territory with a lot of resources. They deny the nationalists that platform to threaten the mainland. And of course, Hainan now is um, you know, a hub of Chinese naval power. It gives China a commanding position over the northern approach of the South China Sea. I mean, again, um, like Jingmen, it has these lasting strategic legacies that we can see. Well, these battles are not only being studied by you here in the West, but you know, as you I think mean, meticulously showed in your research, is that they're being very closely studied by the PLA and analysts, you know, the national um, in the Chinese military. So, so, why is the PLA studying these campaigns, and what are they, you know, um, seventy plus years ago, uh, and what are they learning from? Them? Yeah. So, I think in general, um, I think we all recognize the PLA is a learning organization. Um, partly because, as we know, uh, the PLA hasn't fought a major conventional operation since 1979 against, against Vietnam. So it has to learn vicariously through the experiences of others. Um, it has um, studied everything. It has studied, obviously, the recent wars of the past uh, three decades, uh, the first Gulf War all the way to certainly the war in Ukraine. Um, they've uh, studied uh, their own experiences, you know, in particular their experiences in the Chinese Civil War. Um, they also learn from the battles of antiquity, right, to draw parables. Um, and um, as I document in another study that I wrote for CSBA, they're trying to learn lessons from the Pacific War, looking at peer Navy to peer Navy fights, right, of which uh, the combatants were of relatively equal capability. Capability. So I think they're learning from many things. And I think the, the study of this period uh, reminds us that they have their own history to study from, right? 
Um, it's a, and it's a history that's not familiar to us, but it's intimately familiar to them. Just as Normandy landings are intimately familiar, right, to the U.S. Armed Forces, the PLA has its own history to draw from. So I think that's 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 really one sort of starting point for thinking about um, why and how the PLA study its its impact. I think uh, there you know there are some interesting potential lessons that can be drawn that that's relevant today to today, which is that you might uh, think of some of these offshore campaigns of, as archetypes or models, right? Uh, so uh, the PLA waged the Wanshan Island campaign, which I, I, I don't have time to talk about in depth, but it's an island hopping campaign that they've engaged just off the coast of Hong Kong in order to uh, free up the sea lines of communications around the uh, Pearl River Delta zone, which is, of course, very important for maritime commerce. And they basically engage in a series of island hopping campaigns to seize one feature first, gain combat experience, uh, um, boost the morale of the troops, and then take the next target. And part of the process was to, to progressively bite away at enemy capabilities over time while accruing more power to you, and ultimately creating a condition for you to completely evict enemy forces from that area. And they were able to pull that off uh, with, with the yeah, one shot campaign. Uh, so, so you can think of, and their attempts to take Zhou Shan is uh, very, very similar, where they also uh, engaged in this island hopping. But what's important about these campaigns, too, is that they thought very carefully about how do you convert your tactical inferior, uh, your tactical, convert your strategic inferiority through. Uh, tactical superiority. And so what the PLA tried to do was to mass tactical superiority against weakened, isolated garrisons and units, and basically to engage in battles of annihilation, and then again to build up strength over time in this island seizing campaign. So it's a really the, the, the sequential approach of this island seizing campaign is represents one of the ways in which the PLA might seek to convert its weakness into strength. Right. Again, by focusing on tactical superiority within uh, larger strategic inferiority. So that might be like one model potentially that could be applicable, say, to the Taiwan contingency. The other one is um, bypassing uh, strengths and going after weaknesses. So the Hainan campaign is a really good example of that, right? Where they bypassed the frontline defenders the north of Hainan, inserted troops behind the enemy and then strengthen your own forces from the rear. Uh, and that might also be a potential model or archetype. In a Taiwan contingency today, we worry about the role of fifth column forces, right? The Chongya column is a really good sort of example where history seems to be rhyming, right? The, the PLA has a history of using uh, these irregular, unorthodox forces behind enemy lines to engage in disruptive activities. Uh, and of course, we worry about the Taiwan's east coast as being relatively less well defended, right? It's maybe the kind of the soft underbelly of Taiwan's defenses. Well, again, the Hainan campaign shows that there, there are these historical precedents where the PLA try to bypass strengths to go after the enemy's sort of soft or you know, weaker, weaker flanks. So it seems to me that we can, you can think of these campaigns as, as potential models or archetypes that might help to inform uh, PLA thinking. But I think specifically related to Taiwan, I think these campaigns demonstrate repeatedly to PLA analysts that study this history that mass matters. You need to just have a lot of stuff to make this happen. You need to have a lot of shipping. You need to have a lot of firepower. You need to prepare like crazy. You need to be very, very prepared through training and exercises, right? And I think the thing that they really uh, focus on is don't underestimate Taiwan. Because the cases where they failed was where they succumbed to hubris, where they succumbed to the victory disease, when they underestimated uh, the nationalist defenders, and that's when uh, their operations uh, failed. Uh, and so this is especially important to PLA analysts, it seems to me, in recent years, because, of course, China is becoming that much stronger than Taiwan, and that there is even a greater temptation right, to underestimate Taiwanese defenders. And so they use these as basically parables and saying, okay, it might look like we're very strong, but look at what happened in these cases. So please do not underestimate your adversary. I mean, and just a heads up for our audience members, both here um, and online, uh, I do want to get to your questions. And so if you do have questions for those of you joining us online, 
You may submit uh, them to contact at globaltaiwan.org or use the uh, YouTube chat function. Uh, you can also tweet us uh, at Global Taiwan. Uh, I have so many more questions that I want to ask you, Toshi, uh, but I won't be able to get through all of them. Um, but I want to leave you with one question and it will turn to uh, audience Q&A. And that is, and this is related to your previous, book, the previous question about what the PLA is studying from and learning from this. And I wonder to what extent, you know, Taiwan is learning, you know, the Taiwan's defense community is learning from these campaigns or from these battles. And in your view, what should Taiwan understand about how and what the PLA is learning uh, from, uh, from these campaigns? And battles? Yeah, so in doing the literature review, I actually relied quite a bit uh, on uh, ROC Armed Forces Journals. I use them actually to uh, to be basically as a cross check against the PLA's literature, because the PLA literature, as I admit at the beginning of the book, frequently is uh, dealing in uh, in a hagiography, in engaging in triumphalism, and they frequently sort of twist the narratives in ways that demonize the adversary and so forth. So there's a real requirement to try to lend balance to the analysis by looking at uh, ROC sources. And so I use those journals as a way cross-reference to sort of, you know, sort of counterbalance uh, some of the narratives to make sure that uh, the CCP is not sort of misrepresenting some of these campaigns. So there is significant evidence that the ROC has been studying these these um, cases as a retrospective case studies. Um, I think uh, uh, the lessons for uh, the ROC uh, for Taiwan may be uh, that they want to make sure that uh, they can replicate Jingmen. Uh, that they want to be able to have the forces sufficient to make the PLA worry that if they did try, even if they did pull the trigger, that Jingmen could happen, right? Um, and I think there's there's a, a, an interesting pattern in operations where, uh, you know, in these campaigns, when the nationalists double down and reinforced their positions, either uh, on Jingmen or Zhoushan, the PLA failed. The PLA stopped in their tracks, and I think that 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 raises some really interesting questions. Uh, understandably, the PLA literature tends to talk about the heroics of the communists and so forth. But is it possible, uh, in actually more carefully looking at the, these campaigns, it's less about PLA brilliance, but really nationalist weaknesses at the time, right? And so I think it's important. Uh, uh, to kind of put put the PLA victories in that context. It's not that the PLA necessarily won, it's more about the nationalists perhaps losing, right? And so I think that that uh, creates a kind of a different twist to the narrative. Um, I would also say a couple of things about diagnosing the PLA too, and that's it's not just what Taiwan can learn, but what the United States can learn. Anyone who's familiar with this history would not be surprised that that China has been very adept at using paramilitary forces. China Coast Guard, the maritime militia, uh, it comes from this period. Uh, the use of uh, civilian transports right, during this period certainly rhymes with the growing literature today in the PLA community about the use of um, civilian transports right, for an amphibious assault using the roll on roll off ships, which has become a real topic of, of interest. Or uh, China's adept use and willingness to engage in uh, dual use access, right? Using commercial facilities as the basis, uh, as a tip of the spear to enhance their potential military access in the future. That's also, I think, goes back to this period of having a high degree of willingness to mobilize civilian assets for military purposes, or uh, the idea that the PLA is very adept at mobilizing all of nation, right? the entire society, this effort. I think that will also be an important component of the PLA's prospects for success in a campaign over Taiwan, the degree to which they're able to mobilize national resources for uh, such a campaign. So I think, in my view, studying this period, 49-50, reveals a lot about the PLA that will be valuable not only to defenders of Taiwan, but also to... Thank you, Those are incredible insights. Um, so, uh, even though I have a lot more questions I want to ask Toshi, I, I do want to 
turn it over to to our audience, both uh, you know here uh, in person as well as online, because I see that we have a great deal and depth of expertise here also as well uh, in the audience. So if you do have a question, uh, please raise your hand, uh, state your name, an affiliation. Um, we don't need. Are we using mics? I hope we are using mics. Okay. Uh, so if you can just wait for the mic, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll turn to you. Over here. Oh, Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm South Korea Navy officer, retired captain, and PhD, and and I really appreciate for GTI today hosting this wonderful event. And also, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Yoshihara uh, to write this book because that writing a book is hard work, especially in the East area, 60, 60s and 70s of, of PLA Navy. We could not find a lot of uh, uh, existing literature. We could not, and, and I really appreciate it. I promise you that I will purchase a book and get it aside and read from the scratch of the book. My question is very simple, uh, broadly, uh, but important question. And what is the uh, differences of PLA, Navy, between the 60s and 70s of under Mao and current present seas Navy? This is very simple, but, uh, but it's a very important question for us because that's, uh, the past is meaningful because of the current. Oh, yeah. Sure, that's a great question. So, you know, I think there are two ways of thinking about uh, how the past uh, informed the present. The first is how it might be different, right? So I think certainly in terms of the Chinese Navy's ambitions today, Xi Jinping's ambitions for creating a world-class Navy, uh, the Navy, the Chinese Navy will undertake a whole range of new missions that will look nothing like the Chinese Navy of the 1950s. 60s. So in my view, understanding this past at least gives us a sense of the baseline right, from which they'll have to depart. Uh, I also believe that um, this past, I think, has instilled a lot of uh, potential institutional inertia, right? And so I think it gives us a sense of the kinds of barriers the Chinese maybe will have to overcome institutionally and organizationally to be able to, say, project power. So one issue is, you know, one question is, how are they going to organize this power projection towards this far sea fleet, right? Is it going to be a subsidiary of the South Sea fleet? Is it going to be a separate organization? How does this history tell us about, about the path dependencies that were created from the moment of creation of the, um, of the Chinese Navy? But there are also periods of continuity. So um, I identified the doctrine of sabotage warfare at sea that was, that was practiced in the early 1950s but formalized in the mid-1950s under the, the Chinese naval commander, uh, Xiao Jingguang. If you read the Chinese Navy's official encyclopedia, sabotage warfare, which is guerrilla warfare at sea, is still subsumed under uh, offshore defense doctrine, uh, meaning that they will continue to use platforms to wage uh, littoral near-coast operations to defend the approaches of the mainland. Uh, and again, if you think about their uh, deployment of the Typho 2-2, Last attack on Cattle Ran, uh, uh, also defense uh, boat armed with anti ship cruise missiles. Those are essentially the descendants, uh, the successors to the torpedo boats uh, and the gunboats that the PLAN used in the 1950s. Uh, if you think about the, the diesel electric submarine force, conventional submarine force, uh, uh, they're considered to be key components of sabotage and warfare at sea. And that's, that's, of course, a major component of the Chinese Navy's war structure. So again, we can't really, you know, truly appreciate what China will do in the littorals without having this understanding of that, the earlier period, and the legacy that that had left behind for the Chinese Navy. Thank you. Thank you. I am, I am Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. When I look at this literature, I see uh, somewhat of an obsession with Mahan. And I'm wondering if that dates back to this period or whether it's ex post facto. Um, it's so bad that, that I get a sense that every Chinese officer is forced now to read uh, the Chinese uh, translation of this uh, British Admiral's book. What's that about, and uh, should we be worried? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, to go back to my point about the PLAN being a learning organization, um, I think they will learn from all sorts of sources, whether it's Western theory and their own theory, um, Gorchkov's writing during the Cold War. Um, and so um, I think it's not surprising that, you know, Mahan is, it, it, you know, features very prominently in the Chinese writings. I think it's an attempt to try to better understand naval affairs through different analytical frameworks. But I do think that Chinese sea power with large and Chinese, the Chinese Navy actually reflect all of the sort of the key theoretical contributions that we study in professional military education. So I think at the high strategic level, the Chinese Navy and Chinese sea power is very Mahanian in the sense that it is derived from these big driving forces, the quest for wealth through maritime commerce is, a, is an argument that Mahan advanced. The Chinese sea power is clearly following that path. Uh, if you're looking at these amphibious operations, I think the sea power here is that Julian Corbett actually would, would seem to fit this description of the use of sea forces in conjunction with land forces to achieve your operational objectives, right? These are inherently joint combined arms campaigns and seem to fulfill some of the key principles articulated by Corbett. But I think Mao's own theories have come into play, right? So uh, this whole idea of guerrilla warfare, as the sabotage warfare, the traces its origins to Mao's own theorizing in the 1930s about how you would wage guerrilla warfare in order to convert weakness into strength by engaging in these small scale battles of annihilation that will eventually shift the larger balance of power through uh, these operational uh, attritional combat. So it seems to me that if you look at the Chinese Navy's um, patterns of behavior and thinking, uh, they seem to reflect, actually, and fit very well all of these, um, what, what, what you might say, are universally applicable theories on warfare in general and naval warfare. So, thank you so much. We've exhausted our time with you. Um, I have so many questions I'm sure I'm going to take offline and ask you and ping you about afterwards. Uh, but thank you so much for writing this book and for spending this afternoon with the GTI to discuss its key findings and themes, and I think you really uh, highlighted the importance of understanding how the PLA understands its own history and its an ap application to today, and I hope uh, that we'll be able to benefit from your uh, research continuing in the future as you, I know, continue on your projects of uh, learning from how the PLA studies its own history uh, in your future efforts. Uh, so please join me in, uh, in, in thanking uh, Dr. Toshiyoshi Hara. Uh, we do have a QR code uh, for uh, for Toshi's book, so if you want to just easily scan that and then you can purchase a copy, uh, make it convenient for you. And um, But if you happen to have your own copy, I'm sure uh, Toshi would be more than willing to uh, sign it for you because we have copies ourselves that people like. <laughs>